Welcome Art 106 group. This is a um, narrated version of a PowerPoint in an effort to save some time in class. So this is the next lecture. It's entitled, as you can read, Why Comics? What is unique about comics? So multimodal is how we describe comic books. It means there's a combination of two or more modes that create meaning. In this case, at least two being words and the written language. A multimodal source is characterized by the juxtaposition of image and text, the interaction of that image and text. Also, in a multimodal piece, Sequential images convey a sense of time and or motion. Within the visual realm of comics, comic books and comic strips, there are varying styles, varying levels of realism. Some are black and white, some are color, some are strips, some are books, different styles of writing, some are graphic novels. It's a term that's become very uh, popular in the last 10 or 20 years. When I first started collecting comics, it just meant a collection of comics in um, a soft-bound book. But these days, the graphic novel is something unto itself. They are mostly original stories. So here we go through what characterizes a multimodal form of communication, the juxtaposition of text and image. That's all it is. Text and images are near each other. The interaction of the text and image, all different ways. The small inset image is pretty traditional with the narration in the box, but if you look on your left, that is highly innovative way of doing text. That's Will Eisner, so that's that's not new. Did that a long time ago. All kinds of creative possibilities here. Here's some more. Feel free to pause me and look at these longer if you want. So time and motion. Stories are all about timing. Comic books manage in a very peculiar way because comic book panels are the only visual medium that breaks time into moments, not seconds. Each panel can take as long or as short as needed, as long as you need in order to read it. And there can be as much time in between as is required. So how do we know time has passed? The panels tell us that basically in between each panel, something has happened that has had a cause or an effect rather. A cause in one panel leads to an effect in the second panel. This is a somewhat um, of an unusual situation in that the background image stays the same throughout all these panels and only the figures move. But the figures move into different places within that set or that environment. So we see a passage of time. They actually change locations, but it's all on top of the same house. We see like in the fourth panel there, there's an addition of a new character that shows time has passed. And now he's climbing up on the roof to join the others. And now he's getting down. So we know that time is passing. Similarly, the sense of motion is created. We see different positions of the characters in each frame and they change relation to one another. Also kind of interesting, the, the way that elements cross from one panel into another, like the ladder. I mean, the, the house itself does. But um, it's not, I've been reading comic books since I was nine, and this is not the kind of um, setup I have seen that often. I think it's really pretty cool. Here the sense of time is created in a similar way. You can look at the, uh, look at the first two panels. The one has a drop in the water on the ground and the other one does not. So we know that time is moving. And then very much, very much like film. We mentioned storyboards in the first lecture of this class. That's what are made or are used when you're making a film or video, videos, um, commercials, anything that's going to be moving. Uh, we start with drawings just like this. And you can see how the same 
um, vocabulary even of zooming in and panning over would apply to movies as well as to comics or multimodal communications. The passage of time is also shown by literally she has a watch on, so we know some time has passed. There's a cause and effect. Walks in, touches the switch, and the light goes on. We see the lights go on. We see sound effects have it happening as a result of things the character is doing. It's really quite fascinating. We just don't see the spaces in between. That's where our imagination takes over. Or, we, or do we really need them? We can infer what has happened by what we're seeing in the actual panels. It's part of the, the wonder of this medium. Also shows the idea of close up and pans and zooms. You see that when you read scripts for comics, very often they use a lot of that same terminology. The possibilities are endless between how the panel can be arranged, what the characters are doing, how much time has passed, how much motion there is. It's a medium that allows for a lot of creative interpretation. So in comics, information is indeed communicated and processed along the two modes, the visual and the verbal. But within those, there are an endless way for the two modes to interact with each other, to tell a story. They tell stories that are varied, complex, and endlessly stimulating. You can read it any way you want, I and mean, you should read it starting the upper left and read across the top, but you don't have to. There's no real rules or instructions. Although comics are a, this is a quote, a hybrid word and image form in which two narrative tracks, one verbal and one visual, register temper temporality spatially temporality that's exactly what it says it doesn't blend the visual and verbal or use one to simply illustrate the other but both can be interpreted in their own way if you wish in fact you could read those pictures in a way without those words in a way that could be completely different from what the dialogue that is actually on there I'm not sure how important that point is to what we're doing, but it's sort of interesting, and it's one that people who study comics go into endlessly. I've actually edited this down somewhat because I think it gets a little bit too academic. So we shall press on. So the last picture was from um, a series of Hawkeye, Hawkeye of Avengers fame. Uh, for Marvel Comics, and I don't know how many years ago this is, maybe probably less than 10. But this was a fascinating issue because in it, Clint Hawkeye has been rendered temporarily deaf after an attack at his office building. And so the creative team did the entire um, issue as if with no words. This is from Clint's point of view where he's interpreting things in one way but it's not necessarily the only way. There could be a whole other story going on, and there is a whole other story going on with these characters whose words we cannot read because we cannot hear them. And this is a great multimodal example because it goes beyond simple, quote, comic book visuals in that it includes symbols like we have in the lower right, Symbols and icons and things like just the, the anger word balloon of the character right in the center. That's sort of, and that's, that's a symbol that we all know. If that was like, you know, fluffy looking, we know that was thoughts. If it was just, you know, around like we see on the lower left, we know it's words. Uh, we, we, we could just, there's a lot of different kinds of communication that are going on here. And then we literally have images of people signing, doing American Sign Language. So it's, I think it's really interesting. And even amongst the, the um, illustrations, we've got, you know, the various, um, you know, typical kind of medium shots, close-ups, the silhouettes, full body shots. Very cool. Another example. Oh, I know why I put this in here. 
another example of communication, of writing that's on things within the comic story itself. It's not dialogue, it's not narration, it's not being um, added by someone later, it's not an um, omniscient observer, it's literally on the clothes of the character, immersed in the story. Another characteristic, or a tool rather, that's used in comic books is metaphor, or comics in general. So you think you see even more like in political comics and newspaper comics. So metaphor allows us to grasp an unfamiliar concept by imagining this concept in terms of concepts we already understand. So it's a mental shortcut of sorts. So we understand what's happening in this person's brain because we understand uh, how a car battery is charged up. The synapses are wires. We can understand that more than we can say understand the, the medical talk or the medical reasons. Um, this is easier for us. Here we have concepts like CO2 in the air being represented by the balloons uh, flying away or the economy crashing, economy being represented by the truck that has fallen into the ditch. Um, so all that's being communicated and without many words. I mean, just really identifying the truck as the economy and the CO2 on the balloons, but there's a lot going on here, multimodal. So metaphor can be, there's a few different ways to approach a metaphor. Sometimes it can be dominant image, or image dominant. This is an example of one of those where the reader can understand the message being conveyed and the content um, without having the words. It's clear that this person in the panel has turned into a sort of machine, a wind-up toy that repeats activities by automation. There actually are words, but this text here just serves to further refine the idea and contextualizes the sequence. It adds a sort of soundtrack, if you will, to the visual channel. That's the words of Scott McCloud, who is a writer of um, history of comics. And the soundtrack does appear as an integral part of multimodal expression of the underlying metaphor, but it's not as dominant as the image. The flip side of that is when something is text dominant. So here the primary manifestation of a metaphor of the metaphor is verbal. You can read it. No matter where you run, fear will seek you out. It is undeniable, unstoppable, merciless, all a bad joke. The visual channel supports the metaphor, the textual metaphor. Um, if you were to analyze this panel the other way around, we, no doubt that the image would not be enough to convey the intended metaphorical content. I mean, all this about fear, if you, if you took those words off, it might be scary, but it could be something about a funhouse. I mean, it's the Joker, um, but the, this is text dominant. The final category of multimodal metaphors is called complementary metaphors. Here, the conceptual metaphor is expressed through two strands. The first one is the, in this example anyway, is the verbal strand that contains the idiom to keep one at arm's length. It's positioned carefully and intentionally between the two characters. And the second strand is the image of the two people sitting at the table in a diner. They are drawn disproportionately small in relation to their surroundings in order to emphasize the distance between them, the emotional distance between them. So these are called interdependent because the two do not express the same thing literally, but they depend on each other to create the message that might have otherwise um, been conveyed more or less unsatisfyingly. In other words, on their own, they say something, but, but they say it much better together, interdependent. History and culture. Now, this is, this is really just a, to wrap up sort of what comics, mostly comic books, have um, the areas that they have um, gone into over the years. They not only can entertain us, but they also can relay history and culture. This is a series that's based on Civil Rights March, marches from the 60s. This comic is based, as it says there, in Ethiopia, 2012, based on a true story. Despite being a realistic subject matter, it doesn't necessarily rely on realistic illustrations. It doesn't need to. It captures historical fact as well as 
cultural artifacts like their dress, the environment, various customs. As real people, I think this is from a panel from within the March comics about John Lewis. Mouse was a graphic novel created by the American cartoonist named Art Spiegelman. It was serialized from 1980 to all the way to 1991. It depicts Spiegelman interviewing his father about his father's experience. Oops, hit the wrong button. His father's experience um, as a Polish Jew and a Holocaust survivor. I have to save all my comics. I have never read this one. I think I've been kind of scared to. The work employs postmodernist techniques that represent Jews as mice. Germans are represented as cats and the Poles are as pigs. Critics have classified Mouse as a memoir, a biography, a history, fiction, autobiography, or a mix of genres. It's been described as all those things. It is the first and still the only, and I checked this out, graphic novel to win a Pulitzer Prize. It got a special award in letters. cultural touchstones that I had to add in to being a child of the 70s. I still remember when Superman and Muhammad Ali came out. The Kiss comic was very exciting. We were all drawing the Kiss characters. Comics can be timely. This is a page from what's called The Perilous Journey, which is a trilogy of three comics based on the testimonies taken from Syrian refugees that were seeking asylum in Scandinavia in 2015. Beautiful. Comics can be autobiographical. They can instruct, educate. Fun Home, I don't know if you're familiar, if you're, if you're not familiar with it, go out now and buy it right now and read it. Um, it's, it the title is Fun Home, a Family Tragic Comedy. It's 2006 graphic memoir by American cartoonist named Alison Bechtel. And you might have heard of her, her name. We talk about the Bechtel scale in movies it's it's all this a feminist scale about like how many women are in a movie and how they interact with each other and the movies are rated based on that uh, i'm actually not sure why it's named after her i guess she had done it she's she's done a lot over, over over her lifetime so anyway it chronicles her childhood um as a youth in rural pennsylvania it focuses on her complex relationship with her father the book addresses the themes of sexual orientation, gender roles, suicide, emotional abuse, dysfunctional family life, and the role of literature in understanding oneself and one's family. And it is a little fun fact. Writing and illustrating it took seven years, in part because of her laborious artistic process, which includes photographing herself in poses for each human figure. This is another one called This One Summer. It's a graphic novel written by Mariko Tamiki. It's illustrated by Jillian Tamiki and published in 2014. And it is a coming of age story about two teenage friends, Rose and Wendy, who during the summer in Awago, a small beach town, which I'm presuming is in Japan, um, Rose and Wendy discover themselves and their sexuality while battling family dynamics and mental disabilities. So definitely not, not Archie, that's for, that's for damn sure. Another one called Rosalie Lighting. It's been Eisner nominated, which is an award. Um, beautiful and touching graphic memoir about the untimely death of this author's young daughter. Oof. Let's get some fun stuff here. Can be instructional comic books. Instruct and educate. This is more comics than comic books, I guess. Informational. Tornado safety. It. We all taking in information differently and being multimodal allows usually appeals to more people it can um, get to people who might not read just the words it's becoming more and more popular um, as our ideas of education and um, everyone getting an equal education um, become more and more uh, dominant in the educational world Understanding rhetoric. I think I'm going to skip that one. And with that, we end our little journey into what makes comics unique. See you soon.